Okay, uh, hello there everyone, and uh, thank you for coming to our weekly Anthology 101 lecture at the University of Victoria. Uh, today we are, again, uh, very lucky to have uh, Dr. Paul Hornby here to uh, talk about the research into, into cannabis and the chemistry as it were, uh, of can can cannabis. Excuse me. And uh, it's always a pleasure to have him here talking about uh, what he's been, been up to. Um, we've had Paul here, I think, for so the fifth year in a row, uh, possibly longer. It's hard to, for me to say. Um, this is the eighth year of the lecture series, so it may be at least five years now. Um, anyway, um, Paul uh, has done a, a number of talks before, and uh, you can find them on our YouTube channel. And, and rather than you know, go over uh, what he's done before, I, I think most of today's discussion is going to be uh, question and answers from the club. But uh, I know there's a few of us that could actually take up an hour of dialogue with, with uh, Paul here about the various uh, constituents of cannabis. And so uh, we're very happy to have him here uh, for this uh, Q&A, as it were. And uh, looking forward to learning more about juicing and other stuff like that. So, uh, thank you very much for, for coming over to Paul, and uh, always a pleasure to have you. You hear me okay back there? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Now we can. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to be here, Ted, and uh, I always really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I'm, my lab is up the, up the island now. I always used to love coming over here to do the lectures every year for the past five. But now I've actually located the lab on the island, so I've got no reason to complain anymore. I still live in the city in Vancouver, but I spend at least three or four days a week here as a rule. Um, I'd like to just do a, a free-for-all today. I don't have a, a talk prepared per se. I got a bunch of slides here, but they're kind of out of order. And um, what I'd just like to do is answer any questions that people might have about medical cannabis and right from the seed up to the making medicine out of it. Um, I'll just get started with um, but it at any time and stop me and ask questions. Um, my background degree is in zoology uh, in the UK. I did a bachelor's degree there in animal endocrinology with specialty in RIA, which is radio amino acid, was the technology I used biochemistry was my master's degree where I was running nuclear magnetic resonance as an instrument and my doctorate degree in human pathology was down on beaches in India in the mountains of Mindoro in the Philippines and in the Canadian Arctic and when I was back in the lab I was running HPLC, GC mass spec and LC mass spec. So the point of my, I guess, of this slide is my background has been in the biological sciences with an opportunity to get behind sophisticated high-tech equipment. Recently, I traveled to Madrid, Spain for a conference and had the delightful honor of meeting Manuel Guzman, this fellow in the photograph here, who is one of the few scientists in the world doing high-tech, deep space uh, research into the medical effects of endocannabinoids and, and cannabis in general. Uh, he's allowed to do this in Spain because of the government shift in policy on legality of cannabis there. Uh, it's really an interesting scenario that the more medical the cannabis, the more legal it is in the eyes of the law. So if you're caught with a, a uh, well, it would, because they allow science into the courts there, it's easily, easy for someone like myself to produce prove the medical benefit of one strain of cannabis against another. Um, 
show you what I mean. I'm going to skip around to apologize for jumping all over the place. But, um, that's what I mean by a cannabinoid profile. Um, this is THC acid. The bigger the peak, the more of the compound there is. And all these, this is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. This is cannabinolic acid, cannabinol, cannabidiolic acid, cannabidiol. And when this is heated, it turns into delta-9 THC. It binds the receptor. This doesn't bind the receptor. You've got to heat it up. And then after we heat it up, we run, if we run the same sample, we'll see that this peak has gone down and it's come up over here with delta-9 THC. That's psychoactive, that's not psychoactive. Anyway, the point I was going to make is that that's a medicinal profile. That's what I call psychoweed. That's PC bud. With a, a whole lot of THC, but very little can have a dial. This is a strain from Vancouver Island. One of the reasons I'm, my lab is on the island now is because of this strain. <coughs> it's highly unusual. This, um, I've scoured the island and surrounding islands uh, for more of this genetics, but have not found it. Um, it's a pocket that exists here on the island, and whoop! <laughs> Move back to that one. And uh, of course, all strains originally are outdoors, but we now have this strain growing indoor, and it's reproducible. I get for the, the last five years, um, and it is very unusual because of this high cannabidiol content. That's cannabidiolic acid. When you heat it, it turns into cannabidiol, the same as the THC does. So that's medicine. Uh, oh, shit. sorry. That's psychoweed. Now, how do you get cannabidiol in uh, your cannabis? You have to get the genetics strain. You have to breed it in. Now, you can do that with hemp, if you dare. Uh, because if you start growing hemp, you get a low, genetically low THC amount for the high cannabidiol. Am I skipping through these? Um, this is an overlay of a text, say, the time warp strain. The Haley's Comet, that m medicinal strain, as I call it, um, had a text, say, the time warp mother common strain to Vancouver Island, but nobody knows who Daddy is. Uh, so there's no seed for it at this time, uh, but we're going to back cross it and uh, get viable seed from it. And make it available to people because this cannabidiol, the more research that's coming out is proving to be one of the most powerful anti-inflammatories that man has known. Uh, and inflammation to a human pathologist as myself is really at the basis of all disease with an inflammatory component to most illness. And inflammation, you end disease, you move toward a cure rather than toward more illness. Any questions about Ailey's comment or about my rant? Uh, yeah, let's go. Um, 
Well, after you, the um, results of the uh, juice that we, the hemp juice that we made this summer that you tested for us, with the amount of CBAs that uh, came out of that, I'm wondering why don't we just use hemp? Can you shout that out to me, Ted? Uh-oh. Um, she, she said in, in uh, after looking at our test results, uh, or the ones that you got uh, or did from the hemp juice uh, and the farm that in Saskatchewan, um, the uh, and, and the higher CBD content. Uh, why why wouldn't we use uh, hemp uh, in, instead of these other products or these other strains? That was your question. I, I have an obvious idea, Ted. It baffles me. Um, I came into this medical cannabis world through the hemp door. I had a license to analyze industrial hemp for Health Canada to make sure that it was less than 0.3% THC. In doing that work, I saw many uh, profiles like this. I'm trying to find one of, of a couple of hemp strains here um, that differed between all the strains. Each one had a different profile. And that told me that there was different medicine and different strains. Each one had a different pharmacology. And knowing that there were thousands of strains of cannabis, there they are, um, that told me there was a whole lot of medicine in that plant. And we're just looking at the cannabinoids here. There's also uh, a whole other realm of let me make the point on the hemp strains first. Uh, that's cannabidiol there, cannabidiolic acid, THC acid, that's THC. Now these are two different Chinese hemp strains, each one with the genetics producing very different cannabinoid profiles. This one we're going to breed uh, in a sealed room with possibly Hades Comet, but we're after this molecule here. There's enough of this in the world, uh, in my mind, as as a human pathologist. Um, this is an extremely important molecule. I can't emphasize enough how important medically it is. Um, it binds mostly what's called the CB2 receptors, which are the, how do I put it? The, internal balancing act of your immune system, uh, inflammatory conditions, once again, are balanced out by the CD2 receptor. As the CD1 receptor balances out your nervous system. Um, but the other world is the terpenes. Uh, we can't see with our current technology that we have in our lab. We have HPLC, uh, which is um, a, we have three of them actually, um, which is the, the best way of looking at cannabinoids uh, because it does it at room temperature and you can do baked goods. Um, I don't have that slide here. Anyway, the, uh, the terpenes are the aromatics, the smell of the cannabis plant. And what does anybody do when they, they buy a bag of pot? First thing they do is to taste it smell. smell it. <laughs> and I've often said there's a whole medicinal science out there called aromatherapy because these are brain active molecules. They, um, will interact with nerve cells, there's receptors for some of them, but they provide the, the aromatic um, fragrance, the aromatherapy from the plant. These compounds have been banned as long as the plant. Um, and there's a whole, like I say, med medical science out there around the value. Excuse me, did you say they've been banned? Yes, they're illegal. You can't sell cannabis essential oils. 
Okay, but, but those like those chemicals haven't been listed as banned chemicals. Uh, from cannabis they are, yes, if they're extracted from cannabis, they're illegal. I didn't make up the rules, Ted. Fair enough. No, I've, I've not heard of this before. So is that in the Food and Drug Act then? Because they're not listed in... Yes. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh -huh. uh, the essential oils of cannabis can be extracted and utilized. Not by aromatherapists, anyway. I, they'd love to get their hands on it. Well, maybe we'll bring that up in our trial, too. There was a fellow back east, I won't name names, that was extracting essential oils and selling them on the internet, and awesome. they busted them. Has he been convicted? This is it? a few years ago now. Huh. And, uh, I mean, he was doing it on the internet, but they still didn't like it. So. Yeah. But it, as far as I understand, Ted, the aromatics and central oils extracted from the cannabis plant, which could really only be done properly with steam distillation, those extracts are illegal. And that's what would normally go to an aromatherapist, uh, is those extracts. What we need GC mass spectroscopy to measure these compounds, you know, they don't have double bonds, a lot of double bonds. We could actually see this one with our HPLC, but um, if there's no double bonds in the ring, then we don't see it. You want me to get into a bit of how we see it? That's an old HPLC, they call it the 57 Chevy of HPLC, this is a never die instrument. <laughs> I inherited one from BCIT, uh, and thank you to them for uh, helping me with that. This like I said, it's an everyday instrument and it does all the analytical work uh, for us. This is a little bag of tea that got me into the medical <coughs> cannabis realm years ago, 14 years ago actually. Um, like I say, I was analyzing industrial hemp for THC content and a fellow called up and asked if I could measure the THC and his tea. I said, sure. I asked why, and he said, I want to get it by Health Canada. They won't let me sell it. He was selling it in Grand Forks, and uh, little old ladies were coming up to him on the street and hugging him and thanking him for a good night's sleep. And indeed, there was the allowable level of THC, which was 0.3% in this tea, but there was a big slug of that dial there. And I do have, I, I could run this, I have, still have this bag. Uh, I have a couple of others, but um, I ran a sample from this recently and the THC was still there and the CBD <coughs> got destroyed. So it does last a while. This is stored in a room temperature in a brown paper bag. Wow. How much cool. of it had converted from THC acid over to THC? Um, that only that happens with heat, and in this case... I've so been told it does over time as well. No? It turns to CBN over time as oh. it breaks down. It oxidizes to CBN. Um, but I didn't see a significant increase in the CBN. So I'm assuming it's not broken down. Um, you know, it is surprisingly stable. You know, I've, I've had shelf life for what we call the canna caps um, over three years. No change. Uh, at room temperature in dark jars. But, uh, it is surprisingly stable. Awesome. That's good to know. So in, in Spain, they're talking revolution. And the more I research cannabis as medicine, uh, the more I realize why it's illegal, uh, because it's one of the most, well, it is 
to my mind, the most valuable herbal medicine we have available to us by far. I've studied herbs and supplements for 30 years now. And uh, it has all kinds of uses. I'm preaching to convert it, I know, but I'm kind of of this belief that, you know, you don't make things that keep people sick. Potentially. Well, we were talking here on the way here in the car about chemotherapy and radiation therapy and my experience in cancer research is that cancer takes a long time to kill you and what kills you here is the therapies and, uh, and the morphine overdose. Drawing is a carbon atom, carbon, carbon, carbon. The carbon has to form four bonds, so here there's a carbon, then there's a bond there, a bond there, then there's a hydrogen there, and a hydrogen there, because you just assume you don't draw it in. But if you look at the structure of this, it's essentially all hydrocarbon. This is all hydrocarbon here. It's just it's oxygen atoms here. This is the only part of the molecule that will like water. The rest of it is fat. It doesn't like water at all. With this carboxyl group, as it's called, with the carbon there, the oxygen, and the oxygen, that's CO2 with a proton on it. Hydrogen is just a proton. This is the weakest bond on the molecule. When you heat it up, this bond vibrates, shakes, flies off as CO2, and you get activated THC. This will bind the receptor, this won't. It's got an arm on it, won't let it lock in. So, that process is called decarboxylation. I go, go on ad nauseum about it in, in lectures like this, but it's, a, it's not well understood by, by many people. It surprises me after so much time that, I mean, you know, it doesn't mean you have to understand what these things are, but the principle in an oven for a certain amount of time, um, it's important to know because you're going to get a lot of activated or, or not activated THC because of the amount of time you spend heating this. Yes, Ted? Now, uh, recently, um, or maybe not so recently, but uh, it, I, I've certainly been learning a little bit about the benefits of THC acid uh, as opposed to the converted THC, in particular in, in juicing. Uh, well, it doesn't have the, the psychoactive effect or the pain-killing effect, it, it, it does seem to be a very potent anti-inflammatory when it's THC acid. However, you said it, it doesn't bind. Does that mean it doesn't bind to the CB1 receptors or the CB2 receptors? And if so, then what does THC acid bind to? Because it does have some effect. It, it'll look at the receptor. It'll hang around. as. But the it activated will lock on to the receptor. But if THC acid is around, it'll get in the way. It'll kind of buffer the effect, like CBE does at the CB1 receptor. It'll lower the energy state of the receptor slightly if it's in the neighborhood and not allowed to bind to THC well with the same sort of depth of effect. Um, uh, what, what does it bind to then? It, it's an antioxidant. Uh, it's uh, it's going to mop up free radical, <coughs> radical electrons. Um, it'll protect your DNA. It'll protect the nerve cell. It'll bring it into homeostasis as locking on to the receptor does. It decreases neurotransmission from the nerve cell. And that decrease in neurotransmission can mean a general slowdown in your central nervous system state, which will allow protection. Uh, it'll allow homeostasis, which is extremely important to biological systems. Uh, that it's a balancing act that happens when the receptor is bound. And the antioxidant, ah, here's a good one. Manuel Guzman said that some recent research that he'd come across showed that when CBD is in the neighborhood of a nerve cell, 
the nerve cell begins producing its own endocannabinoids. It goes into protect protective state without that receptor being bound. It's self-signaling or um, communication. Um, it can be receptor driven or just driven by uh, interaction with the cell membrane, uh, but it's all a calming to the CNS. CD1 system is a, is a balancing calming uh, system. If you get a tall chuck and a gulliver to use a line from Clockwork Orange, the first thing that happens is endocannabinoids are being produced, telling the nerve cell to slow down, don't get inflamed, let's not get stupid, let's, let's just back off. And uh, it's, a, it's a balancing out. The same reason a, after a crack cocaine binge, uh, a alcohol binge, a crystal meth binge, people will seek a joint. It's not to come down, it's to balance out. And hence the extremely important uh, harm reduction and uh, detox capability of cannabis. Um, because it balances out the CNS, it's easier to detox from any drug. We've seen significant reduction in, in uh, methadone consumption when people start using cannabis orally. Um, <coughs> incidentally, we've recently started two clinical studies in clubs in Vancouver. One is called Eden and the other the dispensary which are two of the more progressive and successful clubs in the city. And one will be on methadone consumption specifically. We're going to measure uh, methadone in, in hair samples from members that have volunteered for the study and look for a decrease over a three to six month period. While they're using cannabis orally, they can smoke what they want to, but we'll just track. These are all note takers that have um, volunteered at a time that they'll diary and fill in check in boxes for everything, all the cannabis they consume during the study. We can also, using the instrumentation we have, mon monitor cannabinoid levels in the hair. So we can see a level of cannabinoid and methadone decrease with this with the working hypothesis over time. The other study will be on chronic pain and other opiate and antidepressant consumption at the second club. Uh, so it's fun time and we're seeking ethics committee approval through Phil Lucas, who some of you might know. Would working at addictions in Victoria. What else did I want to show you here? Um, yeah, you see that these decarbox, these aren't decarboxylation, these are boiling points. Uh, are higher than you might think. That's 356 Fahrenheit before CBD goes skyward. You don't have to worry about cooking that off in your oven. THC, you can, you can do it at 315 Fahrenheit for an hour in a sealed container to get full decarboxylation. So most people don't go high enough or long enough uh, in their cooking process. And I always seal it up to the environment or to the oven. And when it starts to smell, then you know you're, you're losing some of your actives. Yes. How, how you seal it up best? You know, I've done it for years in a chemical bomb, which is a metal container that has a screw on top, and it seals up very tight. I mean, you can do it by wrapping it in tin foil, uh, but you'll smell it a lot quicker than you will from my chemical bomb. <laughs> um, but I'm only doing small amounts with that. I just do it for research purposes, and uh, I'm not doing any sort of scaling up or anything with it. Um, what we use at the club is a, a casserole dish, okay. you know, like a glass yeah, kind of casserole dish where yeah. you can, you know, put the lid right over top and, yeah, you know, there's... Yeah, a nice heavy lid, I hope. Yeah, yeah, a nice heavy glass lid, yeah, exactly. Seals up tight. Yep. Yeah. 
you got to check them all out to make sure they get one that seals good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You got to make sure the seal's good is what she said. Yeah. This is where the medicine is in these little balls here. Indigos have big balls and sativas have little balls. But nevertheless, the cannabinoids are made at the base of this, what's called a trichome. And also the terpenes, and they go into these little vesicles. And this is all exudate from the outside of the plant. There's very little cannabinoids internally in the plant. These are there to protect it against insects and rain. And, uh, the more the plant is stressed, the, the bigger these will get, the more they'll fill up with THC to protect the plant. And uh, nevertheless, that's where the medicine comes from. It's not, I'm saying the cannabinoid medicine, the terpenoid medicine comes from here. The phenolics and flavonoids would come from the leaves and the other flower parts. How are we doing for content? Oh, it's half an hour. Um, you still got, let's say, 20 minutes? Huh? That's 20 fast. Minutes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. A little bit less than 20 minutes. Sorry. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. I usually end with this slide, but I'm going to get a little <coughs> mouthier today. Um, because I got, I got the, uh, the plague in the the, the wind uh, or the feel for revolution in Spain is happening amongst the people. And it's spreading right across Europe. And I brought up the $500 billion a year industry earlier uh, that rules in terms of government uh, lobbying ability. They will be, they lobbied the U.S. government more than any other industry last year. Yeah. And uh, this is a plant that could uh, potentially put them out of business um, if indeed it's legalized. So what are we going to do? Uh, I believe that cannabis is a people's medicine that um, no one has the right to restrict the plant in the first place. When you get that idea, you can restrict the plant. So that kind of basic uh, philosophy bothers me. Um, and over the last 14 years, I guess I've sort of committed, committed some civil disobedience in a nonviolent way. Uh, by researching the efficacy and safety of, of cannabis as a medicine. Um, and in that time, realizing its enormous power as that, just as that as a medicine, not as its ability to make petroleum out of it or clothing or anything like that, but its amazing power as a medicine that it could really revolutionize medical thought. Uh, the discovery of the THC itself and its receptor, it only happened in the early 1990s. Um, it's probably one, it's one of the biggest medical finds of the last century, next to DNA and insulin. It's huge, huge, huge. It's bigger than opium, or bigger than the opium receptors. It said this is a, a big, biological system we're talking about here. The endocannabinoid system is throughout our bodies and it's balancing, it's pulling the strings to keep us alive. So understanding that that chemistry, that biology is what I've been attempting to do with the instrumentation I have available and the people that I work with in the clubs in Vancouver who uh, 
sponsor a lot of my research. I also use fertilizer companies uh, to sponsor it too. I've got my name on this product, which is a one-step, easy to use, can't screw it up, good for beginners, uh, grows really good cannabis, medical grade, of course, under license. Um, marijuana. Uh, this is kind of funny. If you ever get too high, you can eat lemon, calamus plant, pine nuts, or black pepper, and it'll come down. Right here. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I should have turned the light on. I thought you were done. Yeah, a thing I noticed when in the five years in the club I was in is that uh, it was the British Celts, the red-haired Highlanders, the Scots, Irish, and Welsh that had the highest tolerance to cannabis. Uh, three to five times more tolerant than a Middle European or a, um, an Asian or a, uh, Africans are a mixed bag and get very tolerant or some people are tolerant at all. But Anyway, tolerance to particularly high THC cannabis is important to know it, particularly if you're giving people cannabis orally, uh, because you can end up overdosing someone on THC, and they go through what we, we call the pinhole, which means fear, paranoia, i got to get out of here, I'm in trouble, there's somebody under the bed, and uh, it can be very, very frightening, an overdose on cannabis. So, if someone does overdose, you can always use these, these four <coughs> counteraction antidotes to THC overdose. Yeah, um, it, it, it's a, a major, major medical find and we have to use it, utilize it uh, to its fullest, I believe. Yeah. I have a question here for you, Paul. Um, if, if you were to test a, a, a plant for its cannabinoid profile, and then you were to make hash out of the same plant, I, I don't know if you've tested this, but would there be a difference in the ratio between THC and CBD between the plant and the, the, the hash? No. No, it's, it's, it's locked into the genetics and you cannot change a cannabinoid profile. It's like a fingerprint. Um, you can increase the amount of THC, CBD, and you can increase the amount of all the cannabinoids with nutrient, lighting, environment, whatever. You cannot change the ratio one to tether of the individual cannabinoids. We tried that at a fertilizer company that I worked for a number of years ago to alter the ratio. We would try to increase cannabidiol with the, with the nutrient, um, but we couldn't do it. All we could do is move it up. It doesn't change. This is locked into the genetics. This unusually high CBD to THC ratio uh, does not change. We see this time and time again. And if we indeed made, if I had the slide here, I could show you how it has been decarboxylated into an oral prep, and that ratio is the same. It doesn't change. So we could extract that into an olive oil, the ratio would be the same? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, you won't change with whatever matrix you put it into either. But uh, that's the, interesting. Well, I, mean, I, should not, I should be careful here. You put into a strong acid or a strong base, you could potentially change the structure of some cannabinoids. Yes. But that would be um, the experiment we're trying. We're talking about that this morning, too. Um, see, I, Oh, I'm going to give away top secret stuff here. <laughs> uh, I asked um, Manuel Guzman in Spain uh, how 
already talked to turn THC into CBD. I don't, don't have them together on a slide here, but if you open this ring right here, THC becomes cannabidiol. It degenerates into it naturally, doesn't it? No, it turns into CBN naturally. CBN, well, okay. Yeah, too bad. Um, I, I asked Dr. David Tate this question, who some of you know in this room. Uh, and he said, you want to turn gold into straw? <laughs> no. <laughs> he was joking, you know. But if you can, we could turn all that THC and DC bud into cannabidiol, we'd have a bucket load of medicine. Um, it's just an idea. So anyway, I, I asked Mr. Manuel Guzman about this, and he said, why don't you ask Rafi, meaning Dr. Rafi Elmer Shulam, true father of all this research, who discovered THC and, and the receptor. 15 years apart, uh, not that long ago. And uh, so I've yet to email him, but I do have his email address with my other hero, Manuel Guzman's uh, backing. So we will learn. Um, don't try this at home, kids. But I guess the point of that, to answer that question, Ted, is you can indeed alter the structure of THC uh, with chemicals, but you cannot, at ratios of the cannabinoids, one to each other is written into the genetics and can't be changed with the nutrient or environment. All you can do is increase it. That's how we, you can't see that very well. Um, that's how we see the THC acid. It's absorbed, absorbing UV light here. This is an increasing wavelength out this way. And this maximum absorption peaks here that we detect it with. And we can confirm the structure of what we're looking at by these fingerprints. This is kind of a show off way of looking at it. This here is nutrient contamination <laughs> in the sample. So we're not only looking at cannabinoids when we're running these profiles, we're looking for did you flush properly? We can even see pesticides here. So this early peak, because these are also fat soluble, pesticides and nutrient normally water soluble, um, we see them first so they come straight through the column. But, but we can easily see if there's contamination in the in the sample up front. Like in this one, this is where it's I think that it's got yeah, suspected pesticide contamination. It's just a tiny little detail, so we wouldn't go after that. Um, but if indeed we do find nutrient or, or a big spike of pesticides in the sample, we can usually go back and determine what pesticide it was. So we do offer our lab is now offering analytical services to uh, and then they are licensees, compassion clubs in Canada of good standing. And uh, you can request these services through my email address. And uh, we do all we do cannabinoid profiles, heavy metals, pesticides, pathogenic bacteria, yeast and mold, so that's a full quality control program and standardization for cannabis medicine that we're offering to those in need. Yes? Past what point would you um, start questioning, questioning it for contamination? Oh, for the pesticide contamination? Yeah. In the milligram per, per gram amounts, something sort of physiologically significant, maybe even high micrograms, but uh, it would a very fairly good slide there. Yes? What sort of prices? Pricing, 
question was, what is pricing on this kind of work? Uh, for single sample cannabinoid profiles, we charge $100 per sample. Uh, if you give us 10 samples, we can talk it down a bit in price to around 75 uh, because it's easier for us to prep and load 10 samples onto the instrument than to do it automatically we'll go away and do something else. So the more the merrier in terms of price. Metals, uh, $75 to $100. Pesticides, around 100 bucks. All these sort of 100 bucks per sample. But to, like I say, the more samples, the lower the price we offer um, contracts to individual clubs that we're working with in Vancouver for a monthly rate. We do standardization and we do quarterly random checks on their product that they're selling. On, on the other parameters. I, I just remembered a question that came up. Uh, have you, and this, this goes along with the other question about, uh, you know, no matter how you extract the cannabinoids out of a, a plant, you're gonna get the same profile. Uh, have you done testing to see which uh, um, olive oils uh, uh, or other kind of uh, uh, alcohols are, are the most effective for extracting? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, I've only recently started working with edible oils to extract. I normally work with solvents. And the solvent that I found most specific to cannabinoids is one called tetrahydrouran, um, THF, as it's known to, but you could only get it through a chemical supplier. It's not available in shoppers. Uh, let, me sh let me find out. Um, but it, it's very specific to the cannabinoids. Because it's, it's a ring like this. And that, that's all it is, just a ring with an oxygen atom in it. So it, it'll lock onto all these rings and specifically pull it into the solution. And what about the olive oils? Or like olive oil, grapeseed oil, coconut oil, we tested them. Yeah, um, all will solubilize cannabinoids quite effectively. Which one is better? I really believe it's probably depending on what you're going to use it for. Um, which one would be the better oil? Oh. But they're all about the same in terms of efficiency of extraction. That's a good question, Ted. Um, <laughs> That's why we're here. <laughs> uh, if you get it heated up, you'll get a more efficient extraction if you heat your oil up. But you don't know what compared to the other, like coconut oil versus grapeseed oil. I can't okay. visualize it. Anyway, we continue to march on oh. <laughs> in the struggle. Um, I just like to make aware that the rules will all change over the next year and a half on licensing and designated groves and our ability to access cannabis medically. Health Canada will publish in what's called the Canadian Gazette in late December, when we're all asleep, uh, their new proposal and it may be our last chance to get our word in and to uh, state our cause and, and get it our way rather than government or farmers way. Um, and you can only do this by speaking together and I know getting taught people to do the same things like herding cats, but this thing is really important and if we're going to be able to utilize this medicine, we have to make it through. <coughs> um, so, be part. I'm becoming an activist, Ted. What's happening to me? You hang out with me. <laughs> so, thank you very much here, Paul, for coming over. It's always awesome to have him come over and share his knowledge.
So uh, yeah, I'm going to wrap it up real quick uh, and, and just note that we're going to be in here uh, from now on every Wednesday afternoon doing lectures. That I'm not even sure what I'm talking about next week, but it'll be good. And uh, if I can't think of anything, I'll just play movies. So either way, uh, hopefully you guys will be at the 420 and I'll figure it out by then what I'm doing next week. But uh, thanks everybody for coming and hope you all have a great day. Thanks for coming.